Great. So I think everything is working on my end. Um, and so I'm going to start today's fine. It's uh, nice to see everyone. Um, glad to see everyone I'm back after a short break. Great. So I think everything is working on my end. Um, Sorry, getting and so I'm going to start today's fine. It's uh, nice to see everyone. Um, glad to see everyone I'm back after a short um, Lauren, do you have your second computer on? I, because I, we hear I you talk. I just turned okay. it off. I just wanted to let you all hear me twice. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so apologize for that, but uh, I um, I think we're good to go now. Um, again, it's good to see folks, and happy to be hosting the find this week. Uh, my name is Lauren Hayes. I'm an associate professor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in uh, the United States, and I'm happy to be hosting this week. Um, and I just have a few quick announcements before I introduce our speaker for this week. Um, first of all, I want to thank, um, I was away, so I want to thank the last two speakers, Adriana maldonado Shaparo and Stephen Trumbo, for participating in the fine. Um, their, their seminars, of course, are now at the YouTube site, if anyone wants to catch up on those, myself included. Um, for next week, I'm really excited to announce our, our speaker for next week. Those of you know me know that Nancy Solomon is was my PhD advisor and played a big role in my career development. And she will be giving a seminar on prairie voles, um, focusing on intra and interspecific variation in prairie vole social systems. So that'll be next Tuesday at this time. Um, uh, there was some, there are, we are preparing our seminar series for fall 2021. Um, we're nearly done with that that schedule. And I think what I caught on with Eduardo and Carsten is that next week or soon we'll be sharing that with you so that you guys can all be aware of what's coming. We had some great seminars for again in the fall, a lot of diversity topics, and um, hopefully you guys can all join us again. Uh, that will start in September, so fall in the North Northern Hemisphere, of course. Um, just a reminder about the structure find for those of you who are new attending. Um, if you're new, thanks for joining us and I hope you can come to more of these. Um, the seminar will be about 45 minutes, after which we have up to an hour for discussion where we invite everyone to post questions and ask that you post a question mark in the, um, in the chat function. And if you're on YouTube, uh, someone will be watching to, if you, if you wanna put say something in the chat function there, they'll relay that to me. Uh, I have it here as well and try and Get those questions asked as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this brings me to today's speaker. Um, I'm pleased to um, introduce Lena Grinstead. Um, Dr. Grinstead is a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Um, and you know, I, when I was looking up her history. You know, she has a remarkable, excellent training background. She was a Leather Hume, Early Career Research Fellow at the School of Biological Science at the Royal Holloway University in London, UK. Uh, she also was a postdoc at the University of Sussex, Sussex UK. Uh, prior to that, she did her PhD in evolutionary biology at the Department of Bioscience in Aarhus University in Denmark. And prior to that, she was a master's student at university and an undergraduate student at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark as well. Um, Lena has a you know, Lena is a, a rising star in the field. She's um, just this position she has at the uh, University of Portsmouth. She just got it this year. So she was hired during a pandemic. Uh, so that's a pretty remarkable uh, accomplishment, I think. Um, she has a new lab. So if there are students out there or, or people looking to collaborate on really cool social spiders, um, you know, stick around or stay around afterwards. Um, Lena's expressed interest in talking to people about collaborations. She's expressed interest about having students talk to her about potential research or PhD opportunities at Portsmouth. So, um, you know, after after the discussion is over, um, after you know we have that you know forty five minute seminar, roughly an hour discussion, people will stay around and chat, and that'd be a good time to catch up with her. If not, um, you see her contact information here on the title slide. Um, please send her an email if you're interested in her work. Um, her work is uh, focuses on cooperative breeding and helping behavior, uh, and she, but she's also interested in group foraging, uh, adoption, 
I'm not going, and she studied diversity of taxa, including ants, spiders, and paper wasps. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because she's going to be going to a lot of those in this talk today. Um, she has a good publication record despite early career status, uh, publishing in journals like Evolution, Animal Behavior, Behavioral Ecology, Sociobiology, Molecular Ecology, and Nature Communications. Um, and today she's going to be speaking to us about spiders, uh, and the title of her talk is Using Spiders to Understand the Evolution of Group Living. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lena. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for that uh, fantastic introduction, uh, Lauren. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully this works. Yeah. So I think we're all here today because we all share a fascination uh, about social systems and the evolution of cooperative behavior and helping behavior and um, to sort of understand, like, for example, why has uh, cooperative hunting evolved in some cats and not other cats? Why has it evolved in some spiders and not in other spiders? How has cooperative breeding and cooperative foraging uh, evolved in um, animals such as meerkats? And are the selective drivers that sort of uh, select animals to, to show all these cooperative helping behaviors, are those selective drivers the same um, across animals such as meerkats, lions and spiders? Um, so all of these are really uh, fascinating, exciting questions that I think we can all get excited about. And um, I think um, personally, I think equally it's fascinating to, uh, to ask questions about why do some animals come together in big groups um, without cooperating with each other? So here's an example of some uh, colonially breeding um, birds that, that clearly come together in these huge groups. They're, they're uh, obviously attracted to each other, attracted to the group, but then within that group, they have their own individual territories uh, and they will defend those aggressively uh, against each other. So they won't necessarily show any direct cooperation or direct interactions with each other within those groups. So um, I'm sort of motivated by the evolution of group living in this sort of broader sense of the term. So um, both, um, both so group living systems that are maybe temporary, some that are permanent, um, group living systems where there's, um, you know, cooperation to different uh, degrees. Um, so, so today I'll be talking about how we can use spiders to, to address questions relating to uh, the causes and consequences of, um, of living and breeding and feeding in groups. So um, <clears throat> basically group living spiders tend to be divided into to two very distinct forms of, of group living. So um, today I'll be talking about social spiders and colonial spiders. And these are two very different forms of group living. Um, and of course, there's always you know, some debate about, uh, about definitions, but so just to make it clear that today when I talk about social spiders, I will strictly refer to the types of, to the group living spiders that are cooperative breeders. Um, Colonial spiders are very different, so they are they do um, build these big uh, groups together, but they're territorial within those groups. Um, so these two different forms of group living in spiders, um, they have very different ecology, different behavior, uh, and have very different evolutionary pathways to to become a group living. So my first part of the, my talk today will be focusing on social spiders. And then a second part will be about colonial spiders. And then at the end, I'll, uh, I'll give an example of how, of course, nature is never this sort of binary. And there are obviously exceptions to the rule of the sort of uh, definitions we like to put um, on everything as humans. So um, social spiders are these amazing organisms that build huge, beautiful webs together. Um, so social spider nests can contain hundreds, sometimes thousands of individuals. Um, let me just put a lace pointer. So, um, so for example, in this Anolosimus uh, eximius colony here, uh, we estimated there was about 5,000 spiders living in this. Um, and um, this uh, Stegodiphus mimosarum nest here might have had uh, probably about 500 spiders living in that one. 
Here you can see some stegraphus, uh, social spiders um, attacking a, a giant grasshopper together. Um, so um, social spiders, they are um, cooperative breeders. So just like uh, any other cooperatively breeding um, animals you might be familiar with, so like cooperatively breeding primates or cichlids or meerkats. Um, so what does this mean? This means that um, that all the individuals within the colonies, they're totipotent. So this means that basically all individuals in the colony are absolutely perfectly physiologically capable of reproducing and breeding if given the chance. However, not everybody ends up having the chance to breed uh, within a colony. So we do have reproductive skew. Um, so some females will end up um, uh, just helping out in the nest and, and not breeding. Um, and uh, so this means we have allo maternal care. So all the females within the colony, they will help out uh, rearing the, all the young of the colony. So it doesn't matter if they're breeders or if they're virgins, they will all um, help out uh, rearing the offspring. And the only thing that's, that's perhaps a bit different between um, social spiders and other cooperative breeders is that usually there's a really strict social hierarchy in cooperative breeders. Um, we haven't been able to really show that in spiders, so we don't quite know yet how, how do they actually um, allocate the reproductive roles within the colony. We, we're not quite sure how reproductive skew actually arises, um, but it could be just something as simple as the amount of resources you've obtained at a particular time in development will, will determine who actually um, has enough resources to, uh, to, to reproduce and, and who doesn't. Um, so <clears throat> social spiders, um, so I'm talking about the female only really because um, the females are, are the ones that, that do all the hard work. Um, the males, they mate and die, that's kind of it. Um, so the females, they cooperate in all the different tasks in the colony. They uh, cooperate in prey capture, like you see in this picture here, uh, cooperate in feeding, they cooperate in brood care. So. Um, in this picture, you can see a female. So again, it could be a virgin or it could be a, a, a breeder. She's regurgitating food, um, liquid food, and a baby here is crawling up and, and sucking out that liquid, liquid food from her mouth parts. Um, they, of course, also cooperate in building these fantastic, beautiful webs, like you see in this picture or this picture from, from Kruger National Park here. These beautiful um, nests here surrounded by capture webs. So they cooperate in building these large webs together, of course. Um, so social spiders are phylogenetically rare. So this means that um, there's not that many species that are um, defined as uh, social and cooperative breeding, breeders. Um, less than 20 spider species are defined like social, social spiders. Um, and they mainly occur in the tropics and in the subtropics. Social spiders have evolved from um, subsociality. Um, Subsocial spiders are solitary breeders, and I'd like to just um, give you a bit of definition what I mean of, with uh, subsociality when it uh, when it's regards to spiders. So here's some some examples and, and some nice pictures of of some sub subsocial spiders, and what's um, what's common for all of them is that they have extended maternal care. And in spiders, that means, so basically in spiders, it's, it's actually quite common to have maternal care uh, at the stage of, of caring for the egg sac. So um, spiders, they all uh, produce egg sacs where they, they, they lay all the eggs inside of a, a silken sac, basically. Here, you can see that in this picture and here as well. Um, so it's not uncommon for spiders to look after the egg sac, but when you have extended maternal care, then the maternal care extends beyond when the, when the spiderlings emerge from the egg sac. So like you see in these pictures here, there's a female and she's got all her babies here and she will actively um, you know, protect and feed these babies here. You can see some, some little uh, orange blobs and also babies and here's a mum. Um, so extended maternal care uh, includes active feeding on young. So that can either be the regurgitation behavior um, or it could be that they catch prey and, and, and actively offer it to the, their babies. In some species, this extends to matrophagy, which is a kind of extreme form of, uh, of maternal care, which basically means that at some point, all the babies will, 
um, will go together and eat their mom. So here's a picture of that. So we don't quite know uh, what happens, but uh, as probably a cue is emitted by the mom because at some point all the feet, all the babies will just go together and just attack her and eat her. And she actually um, actively prepares her body to be a, a nice uh, digestible, digestible meal for her babies. Uh, she will sort of liquefy her organs uh, in preparation for this stage. Um, so it, it's very, very good mothering here. Um, so <clears throat> this happens in all of the stick eye for spiders, but not in all social spiders. They don't all uh, do metrophagy. Um, another common feature for uh, all the subsocial spiders is that they all have a prolonged, the juveniles have a prolonged stay in the maternal nest. So this means that after they've eaten their mom or she's died naturally, um, they will continue staying in the maternal nest for a while um, and cooperate in, the, in sort of maintaining the nest and in feeding together. So, um, so they do have a sort of social stage um, um, without the, the mother being there, but this social cooperative stage is always followed by a pre-mating dispersal stage. So before they, uh, they start mating, they will all disperse uh, to live and breed solitarily. So this means that subsocial spiders are outbred solitary breeders. Um, <clears throat> now I should say that this, um, this stage uh, where they, this cooperative stage where they, they stick around in their uh, maternal nest and cooperate with each other, the um, this stage varies hugely between species. Um, and in some species, basically the, the baby spiders end up living their, basically their entire life in the maternal nest and only disperse at the stage where they, um, just before mating. Um, and, and that is where the debate then comes in. Should we, you know, maybe it's appropriate to actually call them social as well, because they do, um, they do cooperate for the majority of the lifetime, but of course um, they don't have cooperative breeding. And that's, that's where I it just for the for my the purpose of my talk today, when I talk about social spiders, it is the ones that remain in the nest and then end up cooperating in, um, in breeding. So basically this pre-mating dispersal stage has been lost in the evolution of sociality in spiders. So this means that, that basically this cooperative stage is, is then prolonged to last their entire lives. They, 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 they don't disperse um, before mating. So they end up just mating with their siblings in their nest. Um, and, and this just happens generation after generation. So they end up becoming extremely inbred. Uh, and we only really see dispersal after they have already made it with their um, relatives in, in, the, in the nest. So, so if, if conditions favor dispersal, they will, after they have made it, uh, maybe a, a pregnant female will then uh, disperse out and start a new colony somewhere. Um, so <clears throat> I'm now gonna <laughs> try to argue that social spiders are a great study system <laughs> to address um, uh, questions related to understanding the causes and, and consequences of sociality. And I've got many different reasons why I think they're fantastic to work with. But one of the, one of the, the, re the really key features is that, um, if, that sociality has evolved multiple times independently in spiders. So that means that we have quite a lot of um, uh, replicas of independent transitions to sociality. So here's a, an example of um, uh, the genus Stegeraifus. Here's a, 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 an example of a subsocial solitary breeder and with just a female and her babies here. And here's an example of a, a social Stegeraifus uh, species with multiple females here and, and then the little babies crawling around here. Um, and and this, is a, this is a partial phylogeny of Stegeraifus. Um, and this genus has three social species in it. So I've, I've indicated those in red. Um, and you can see every time we have a social species, um, its sister species is always subsocial. So basically we have three independent replicas within this genus where we can compare the traits of a social species with its subsocial sister species, which represents its ancestral state. 
Um, so this is really good for um, for having basically multiple um, yeah replicas of of evolutionary transitions where we can try to to understand the, the cost and benefits of group living and and cooperative breeding. Um, we can also um, relatively easily in these spiders manipulate the group sizes. We can even with the social spiders, we can also um, uh, basically make, make them live solitarily and compare the costs and benefits of, of living and breeding solitarily uh, with groups of different sizes uh, within a species. And because they're inver invertebrates, we can, we can obtain quite, quite decent sample sizes. Um, and, and quite easily catch them and man maintain them and uh, manipulate them. So here's a picture where I've, I've painted a, a, a group of, of social spiders with individual color coding so that we can follow each individual to see what they're doing in the colony. Um, so I'd like to give you a, a nice example where I've used this, where we use this approach of, of, um, of comparing the, the traits and social species with their um, subsocial sister species. And this is a study led by a, a fantastic collaborator, uh, Vivi Setapani, um, where we were looking at the consequences of inbreeding. And for this, we used a rad sequencing approach that I won't go into detail with, but it's just uh, to say that this is an approach that, that investigates the um, genetic diversity at, across the entire genome. So it's a genome-wide genetic diversity that we can investigate with this particular method. So uh, just to show you this phylogeny again, <clears throat> and the types of, of uh, data I'll, sh I'll show you uh, now. So basically, we've got the, um, our three uh, species pairs here, uh, and then an out group here. And in this column here, I will show you the, the data for um, individual heterozygosity um, for each species. So that'll be in this column. And then in this column here, I'll show you the, um, the genetic diversity at two different levels at the population level and at the species level. So the species level will always be a, a little sort of dashed uh, column here. And then individual, uh, multiple individual populations will occur uh, underneath. So I'll show you this for, for each single species. Um, so let's have a look at the first species pair. So, um, and, and let's look at the individual heterozygosity um, measurements. And you can see very clearly that the social species has much, much lower individual heterozygosity um, than its subsocial sister species. And then if we look at uh, both the population level and the entire species level is much, much lower as well in the social species as compared to its subsocial sister species representing its um, ancestral state. Um, <clears throat> so three different levels, individual level, population levels and entire species level, we've got extraordinarily low genetic diversity. And then if we look at the next species pair, it's exactly the same pattern. So very low individual hydrosigosity and extremely low levels of uh, population level and species level, um, genome-wide genetic diversity in the social as compared to its subsocial sister species. And again, it's the same for the last um, species pair. So, so basically what we found was that we have significantly lower, in fact, five to 10 times lower um, genome-wide genetic diversity at three different levels in the social species as compared to their ancestral state. Um, so, so what does this, uh, what, what does this mean? Um, if we basically, if, if it was just for inbreeding alone, we wouldn't actually expect the entire species level genetic diversity to be this low because if it was if it was only inbreeding going on here we would we would expect that that each population would and in, would inbreed over time and then end up actually being quite different so that each population would be so different that we would still maintain you know some some level of of, of genetic diversity at the species level but we are actually seeing that even at the species level there's extraordinarily low um, genetic diversity. So basically what we have here, we've got a, a system where we have an obligate inbreeding mating system. It's combined with a female biased sex ratio. So in these spiders, there can be about up to 10 
eight, six to ten times um, uh, may, as many females as males in the colonies. We've also got reproductive skew, so um, so even a few, like uh, only few um, females within the colony will reproduce, and all of this is combined with um, quite high levels of uh, extinction rates of uh, both nest and entire population. So perhaps uh, a disease will sweep through and, and wipe out an entire population. That area will then be repopulated by a single already mated female who's mated with a cousin or a sibling. Um, and she will then repopulate this area. So we will have um, really high um, lineage, entire lineage turnover which ends up homogenizing um, the genetic uh, diversity at the entire species level. Um, so this is all, I find is all quite intriguing. Um, um, and, and what does this then mean for the, for the social spiders themselves? So uh, it of course means that they, they're expected to have very limited ability to speciate and also very limited ability to adapt to changing environments. And uh, it's definitely, uh, we have other evidence pointing uh, to, to the fact that, that, um, that once you become social in a spider, you don't really uh, speciate anymore. Um, that, I mean, that's evidence as well by, just by the fact that every time we have a social species, it's sister species, it's almost always a subsocial and not another social species. Um, but, but the question is, are they, are they really that uh, poorly um, uh, suited to, to adapt to new environments? I don't know. I think it's, um, let, let's have a look at the geographical distributions because they, these social spiders actually occur over vast geographical distributions with, with very different climatic um, conditions. So um, I'll show you where we collected these spiders from. So this social um, Stegodiphus aracinorum, we collected it all the way in the Himalayas uh, and then all the way down in the, in the uh, southern parts of India as well. So spanning really quite different um, climatic uh, environments and, and huge geographical areas. And just again, keep in mind that the, that the genome-wide genetic diversity is extraordinarily low despite this huge geographical area. Um, this uh, Stegodiphus dumicola, we collected it all over um, South Africa from east to west. Um, and the social Mimosarum, we collected in both South Africa and Madagascar. So, so really spanning quite, quite different um, environments. So, so perhaps they're not, um, you know, um, won't be very good at adapting to new environments, but maybe they are just Cap maybe they are capable of, um, of physiological uh, plasticity to such a degree that they can actually occur quite, quite happily in, in many different uh, in environments. Um, so, so that's definitely the, the sort of next step is to look at just how, how plastic are they with regards to their um, uh, physiological um, limitations. Right. I'd like to give you another example where we use this approach of comparing the social with the subsocial um, species. And in this study, this is a study from my, uh, my PhD, um, <clears throat> where I looked at maternal investment strategies. So, um, so I was interested in when, when this transition, this evolutionary transitions happens from being a solitary breeder to being a cooperative breeder, what does that mean for the sort of optimal investment into your offspring. It does that does it change that um, the way you invest into your offspring? So basically, is the transition to sociality associated with a change in the maternal egg investment strategy? So, um, so basically, if you if you imagine that a female has a set amount of resources that she can spend on uh, on reproducing, um, she can either basically invest in loads and loads of tiny little eggs, or she can invest in just a few large eggs that may be higher quality and, and, um, and produce larger offspring that may be higher quality. So that's a sort of trade-off. Do I invest in, in quality or quantity of, of offspring? So you can also ask the question whether cooperative breeding is associated with a change in that trade-off between quality and quantity of offspring. 
Um, and one point that's in, important to mention here is that uh, in social spiders, they tend to produce females tend to produce just a single egg sac in their lifetime. So basically, if we collect that egg sac, that is a really good measurement of the, that spider's uh, optimal investment um, strategy. Um, it it in, entails like the, the entire reproductive resources of that individual spider. Um, so for this study, I, I looked at spiders from two different genera. So the, st the Stegodiphus genus again, where I went to an area um, in India where I, I was able to find one social and two subsocial species living in exactly the same environment. So the same area, the same habitat, in fact, the same sort of bushes they were living on. So they were um, so basically by, by looking at different species within the same area, we're sort of controlling for the environmental factors that might affect maternal investment. Um, in the genus Analosimus, I again went to an area of Ecuador where I found one social and one subsocial species, um, again living in, in exactly the same habitat, so controlling for environmental factors. Um, <clears throat> so what I did was to go and find these colonies, and from each colony, I would collect a few um, egg sacs. I would take the eggs out of those egg sacs and spread them out, out really nicely um, on a black piece of paper so I could take a picture and then use a piece of software to measure each individual egg uh, and count them, of course, as well. So what I found was, so here I've, I've, um, I've color coded the data points according to each species. So the blue ones here are the Stigodiphus spiders. The red ones here are the um, Anolosima spiders. And on the y-axis, we've got the average egg size. Um, and I've plotted them against um, a measure of this, this size of the mother um, spider. So the prosoma width is just a, a good measurement of, of overall spider size. Um, and I did that because, of course, there's quite a lot of differences between the species and how big the females get. So it's just to, in order to control for um, for that factor. So, so basically, uh, hopefully you can see that here we've got the social stegodiphus spider and at any given size of the mother, um, she lays much larger eggs than the subsocial counterparts. And again, the social analosima species here at any given mother size, um, she lays much, much larger eggs than the subsocial counterpart. And if we look at the number of eggs in, in the egg sac, the picture is slightly less clear. And that's basically because uh, apparently spiders just lay exponentially more eggs the larger they get. Um, but hopefully you can still see that within Anolosimus, the social spider down here um, lay uh, smaller, sorry, fewer eggs. Um, and, uh, and the same is true for the social uh, stigraifus spider. Um, and this, this was uh, significant. So basically, to conclude, social spiders lay fewer larger eggs as compared to their uh, subsocial counterparts. Um, and then, um, so basically we can, we can then interpret that as they invest into quality over quantity um, of their offspring. And then the question is then, of course, is this actually an adaptation to corporate cooperative breeding um, or is it just an artifact of the fact that they're inbred or something else? Uh, I would say it's probably not because they're inbred because I don't think they would produce larger eggs, larger offspring when they're inbred if it was, you know, uh, because of inbreeding. Um, so, so if we look at the, um, the facts, well, we know that the females produce only this one um, clutch of eggs each. We know that corporative breeding, it increases both the growth rate and the survival of offspring and social uh, colonies. Um, and social spider juveniles don't disperse from, from the maternal nest. So basically what this all means is that um, because of the, the improved growth and survival of offspring uh, with corporative breeding, we actually increase competition amongst individuals within a colony. So, um, so we might, um, there might be a situation of crowding and competition for limited resources. And, and the limited resources are not only food, but also reproductive roles. Because of reproductive skew, 
um, they also competing for the for the ability to actually reproduce. So if you as a female can produce larger eggs that produces larger babies, they might have a competitive advantage over the smaller ones and end up um, being the reproducers in the colony. So I would argue that um, that this is an, at least an indication that um, that the com a combination of the cost of competition in a crowded space and the benefits of cooperative breeding might select for producing fewer larger eggs in um, in cooperatively breeding spiders. But of course, we also need to keep in mind that uh, the sample size in, is in effect two because I only in this study looked at two social species, so two transitions to sociality. Um, but it, so it would be great to look at this it, with more species in the future as well. <clears throat> so um, this is, that was the end of the part of my uh, social spider part of my talk today. Um, so I'll now, now be talking about colonial spiders instead. <clears throat> So colonial spiders of, is a completely different group living system than the social spiders. So, um, so these colonial spiders, they, uh, they also can build these beautiful, huge webs. They can cover entire trees with spider web. Um, so they do come together, they attach their webs together, but in the colony, they each have their own little separate territory. So in this picture, hopefully you can see that, that there's like sheets here and each sheet is an individual territory of a female. So she'll be sitting in the middle of this sort of round sheet. But then the individual territories are then connected to each other inside the colony. Also uh, in, in this colony at my field site in, in Southern Spain, you can see all these little individual sheets here um, are also uh, the individual territories within the colony. So I'm saying that they're um, that they're territorial and mostly non-cooperative. Um, so basically, what I mean with mostly non-cooperative is that that I, you could argue that they, of course, cooperate in building the sort of um, framework structure of the colony. So they cooperate in maintaining the the, the general structure of it. Uh, but apart from that, that's it. They don't they don't cooperate in in um, catching prey or feeding or breeding. Um, so I would I would argue that these colonial spiders are kind of like a combination of colonial breeding and colonial feeding. So a sort of a, a combination of colonially breeding birds and flocking birds that come together to either uh, breed next to each other or feed next to each other without any sort of direct um, interactions with each other within those colonies. Um, but of course, the the benefits of the system is that they sit still, <laughs> they don't fly around. So, so if you're interested in the in the sort of um, in the transition to to feeding or breeding in a group without any sort of associated complications of, of cooperation, but simply just understanding what are the costs and benefits of just being in a group without any secondary adaptations, um, then I think that this is a really great uh, study system for addressing those types of questions. Um, so I've been um, I've been setting up this this new study system in in southern Spain uh, <clears throat> with a colonial spider called Sotophora citricola, and you can see it here. Here's a female sitting on her nice territory here, um, and she's laid a couple of egg sacs. In fact, these species lay multiple egg sacs, so it's different from the soil spiders. Um, so she lays a string of egg sacs here, and um, and one thing that that I really like about this system, I mean, apart from it just being there and it's really easy just to go and observe it, all the web is transparent. You can see what each individual is doing and what sort of prey they're catching. Um, and you can find uh, colonies of many different sizes. There's also plenty of individuals that, that choose to, to live solitarily. So they're facultatively group living. So we've got a nice range of group sizes and, and, and um, lifestyles. Um, Apart from that, it's really quite nice because they they um, basically this 
these colonies function as a substrate for other species that then live in these colonies as well. So we've got this really nice community of predators within this within these colonies. So um, one uh, one other species that's really common is a cleptoparasite. So this is a little spider called Argyrodus um, that that live. It's an obligate cleptoparasite, so it has to live on somebody else's web. So it crawls around here and just steals prey from the host. Um, we've also got a generalist, um, opportunistic predator that may feed on the host, it may feed on the cleptoparasites, it may feed on just basically anything it, it comes across. So it might be a competitor or, or it might be a predator of the host. Um, we've also got an egg predator that um, I'm probably going to uh, be calling a parasitoid, even though it doesn't actually lay its eggs inside another organism, but it lays its eggs inside the egg sac of the spider. So its larvae will then eat the eggs inside the egg sac. Um, so uh, I do apologize if I call it a parasitoid, <laughs> but um, just for the ease of, um, um, so, but, but actually its larvae eat the, the eggs inside the egg sac. So basically what I'm interested in with this system here is to understand um, the predator-predator interactions, the host parasite dynamics, and how that affects the selective pressures um, for, for group living. So in which ways does, it, does, it like, um, does the presence of all these um, parasites and predators, um, does that select for or against group living? Um, so for example, um, does group living provide some form of protection of, against these parasitoids and, and kleptoparasites. So I'll be showing you some preliminary data now um, that is mainly collected by uh, another great collaborator um, called Ella Deutsch. She's just finishing her PhD at Nottingham University at the moment. Um, and we've got some, yeah, some really preliminary data that indicates that, that with increase in colony size, we may we might find slightly less um, wasp infections and uh, cleptoparasite infections. Um, so each data point here is a, is a, is a population, so it's a field site. Um, so this is the percentage of egg sacs that were infected um, by the wasp or the percentage of nests that were infected by the cleptoparasites. And, and on the x-axis, we've got the mean colony size at that particular field site. So with increasing colony size, we might have some, um, you know, slightly less infections. But I mean, this is very, very preliminary and we obviously need to, to look into this in much more uh, detail. Um, so we also looked at basically one of the things I'd like to to, to find out is whether the selective pressures that these parasites and predators might pose on the host uh, with regards to whether or not they choose to live in groups, um, whether that changes over the season. So, um, so this data here is, uh, is all these different species um, and, and, and their, um, how many females breed uh, over the, uh, the course of a year. So we can see the, our host here, the Cetophora spider is the green one in the middle here. So they basically start breeding in spring. They have a peak here and then they don't breed in the summer because it's just too hot, I think, in Southern Spain. And then they start breeding a little bit again, a second breeding season here in the autumn. And the purple line up here are the cleptoparasites. So these are the spiders. And you can see they, they quite regularly completely outnumber the hosts in these colonies uh, and their, um, their, their breeding over the season is very closely matched with the host. Whereas this uh, generalist predator here is not, um, is not matched in, this, in the same way. So, so the relative abundances of these different um, predators and parasites change over the, the course of the year. And, and I'm interested in finding out basically whether, whether that, um, creates uh, different selective pressures throughout the year. Um, also, we can look at the wasps here. This is a percentage of egg sacs infected. And basically in the beginning of the year when, they, when, the, so tri um, the, when the spiders start breeding, um, there's, there's almost no uh, wasp infections, but then that increases rapidly over the, the spring and then sort of maintains, is still high in, in the second breeding season. 
Um, so, so of course, the selective pressures um, are very different over the course of the year, and this is all obviously very um, preliminary. And 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 I'm asking some questions here about, uh, um, you know, how how this community affects the selective pressures for group living that I obviously can't give you an answer to at the moment because this is all sort of a work in progress. Um, so I just wanted to share with you some of the some of the, the things that I'll be working on in, in the future, basically. Um, and I'd also like to say that if you, that if you find this system particularly um, interesting or, um, or if you, maybe you have some theory about community, um, uh, basically community ecology and how that affects group living, uh, but you've, you, and you've been looking for a, a great study system to test out some theories, please do get in, in touch because I think this is a really lovely system to work on. Um, it's really, it, we can even manipulate the number of the kleptoparasites and the generalist predators in the system quite easily by simply just picking them out and putting them around in other colonies. Um, right, so that's what I wanted to say about colonial spiders. Now, um, <clears throat> I'd like to sum up a little bit about the differences here and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about a sort of exception to the rule. Um, so social spiders, they're completely non-territorial. In fact, you can even put multiple social species together and they'll happily build a nest together. They just, they're very happy, um, non-territorial. Um, they cooperate in absolutely everything, feeding and breeding, and they are uh, family groups, kin groups, uh, and, and so very, uh, very clearly um, kin selection is important in, in the evolution of, of social, uh, sociality in spiders. Um, whereas colonial spiders are territorial within the colonies, they have very little interaction and cooperation amongst them within the colony, um, and they tend to have very limited maternal care. So they might care for the egg sacs, but once the, the babies hatch, um, they, th there's no more care there um, given. Um, so social spiders have evolved via the subsocial route, which is absolutely dependent on maternal care. So, um, so sociality uh, basically is a prerequisite for um, sociality to evolve, to have extended maternal care and interactions among siblings in the nest where, um, where siblings have high tolerance to each other um, and, and, and interaction, interact and, and cooperate. And then of course the loss of the pre-mating dispersal stage. Whereas colonial spiders, we know a bit less about exactly uh, what the evolutionary cost and benefits are for them, but we, we believe that they have evolved um, via direct fitness benefits. So we won't necessarily, we, we don't necessarily need a high relatedness amongst individuals within these colonies because we think they probably, um, they might even aggregate uh, of, with them um, non-relatives. Um, uh, because of increased prey capture efficiency or reduced silt cost, or even perhaps because it pro provides protection against the parasites and predators. Um, so, so those are the sort of um, dif differences. And now I'll give you a little um, exception to the rule, which is a, a, a nice spider system that I, I discovered recently in Indonesia, where that are I mean, they're definitely colonial because they uh, there's very little cooperation or there's little interaction amongst adults in the colonies and they're territorial within the colonies, but they have very high levels of maternal care and definitely interactions um, between siblings. Um, and intriguingly, they also have multiple species living together in the same colonies. So. Um, so here they, they tend to live underneath um, leaves. So here's a, a banana leaf uh, that I've turned over and you can see there's a female with an egg sac, there's a female with babies and there's a female and a male. And they basically just sit right next to each other. So there might be a, a few hundred in a, on a banana tree and they just, all the spiders just sit next to each other in their own little territories. They very clearly know um, <laughs> their boundaries. Um, uh, and then they just um, sit there with, the, with their offspring. And uh, after I had uh, worked on this for a few days in Indonesia, when I first started working on them, I then realized after a few days that actually there were two different species. They, they look extremely similar. Um, so it, didn't, it wasn't immediately obvious to me that there were two different species, but um, genetic evidence has then now 
um, support of the fact that there are de definitely two distinct species. So um, the, there's one called Chikunia nigra, he's the female and the male. And then the other species um, turned out to be new to science. Here's the female and the male. Um, so I decided to, to name it Chikunia Bilde, uh, named after my um, awesome PhD supervisor, Trine Bilde, uh, because I think she's a great uh, female uh, role model in academia. Um, so these two species, they're sister species as well. So they're extremely similar. They look similar, they behave similarly, um, and they live within the colonies together. And yet they're two very genetically distinct species. Um, so they have extended maternal care. So here you can see a female, both species have. Uh, so here's a female that she's caught a little prey and she's offering it to her babies. And here you can see all the babies are running up and, and starting to feed on this prey. Um, so there's no uh, direct cooperation amongst the adults. Uh, so then the question is, of course, what, why do they then come together? in these in these colonies. Um, so I wanted to test this hypothesis that perhaps one of the selective benefits of coming together in a group uh, for these species is that um, if one of them dies, if a female dies before her babies are independent, perhaps they just crawl over and get adopted by a nearby female. So perhaps brood adoption uh, is a selective driver of group living in these species. Uh, and this data was collected by a previous uh, master student of mine, um, Beth Turner. Um, and so basically we asked, do females adopt foreign orphaned young? Um, and we wanted to look at both intraspecific and interspecific, so within the same species and between species. Um, and I wanted to ask, like, could it be that there's asymmetric um, adoption? So could it be that one species is actually kind of a, a like a cuckoo style uh, brood parasite of the other species and just sort of encourages uh, adoption of their young? Um, so, so basically what we did was to find little leaves where there was just a single female and uh, her clutch of young here, and then just like clip the leaves together. And then we would remove a female. And then over the course of the next five days, we would just take pictures of, of the, the clutches uh, so that we could count the babies afterwards. Unfortunately, these are so tiny little spiders and the babies are absolutely uh, tiny, tiny. So we couldn't find a way to actually mark them um, properly. So, so basically all we could do is just to count and see whether the clutch of brood here would then increase over, um, over the next five days. And obviously with all the relevant controls as well. And so very briefly, what we found was that uh, females of both species seem to be absolutely happy adopting babies of the same species, but not of the other species. So I did not find any evidence that there's brood parasitism going on between species. Um, but but uh, but certainly um, it, 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 it seemed that they would ha happily take on additional young. Then, of course, the next question is, do they then also provide the same level of maternal care to the new uh, uh, babies or not? Um, so so there's indication that perhaps brood uh, adoption which increases the survival rate of non-independent orphaned young, uh, could perhaps be a selective driver for group living in these species. Um, of course, if you're female and you end up adopting additional young, that's of course a cost to that female, um, but that cost might be outweighed by, um, by kin selection if you preferentially help genetic kin, and that could occur simply by just making sure that you always sit next to a sister in the colony. Um, and, and in fact, I, I will be exploring that because I've just received a nice big uh, data set um, from, from uh, this study um, with microsatellite data where we can test the genetic relatedness between the females that adopted each other's young. Um, so, right, I, I'm aware that we're running out of time. So just a final concluding slide here. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, using spiders to understand the evolution of group living. Well, social spiders, um, they are uh, great for studying um, um, transition to corporate breeding and elder maternal care because they have multiple repeated transitions to sociality. Um, you can also study cooperative foraging, cooperative hunting, and here I'd like to just make a little advertisement for, for one of my newer papers, which explores a new um, sort of um, evolutionary 
fr like theoretical framework for cooperative hunting. Colonial spiders, on the other hand, um, are great for uh, addressing questions regarding to the um, transition to group living or feeding or breeding in a group, but without direct cooperation. Again, I'd like to do a little advertisement of a recent paper. Um, so in both of these papers, there are new theoretical frameworks and they are spe specifically addressing, um, uh, sorry, group foraging. So if you are interested, happen to be interested in, in group foraging, um, then uh, please <laughs> read these papers and let me know what you think. Um, colonial spiders, uh, well, the, the system I have in, in southern Spain um, can be used to study the effects on um, 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 of the community of predators and parasites on the selective drivers of group living. Um, and the multi-species colonies of spiders um, in, in Indonesia uh, can be used to test whether brood adoption, which is actually a kind of indirect cooperation. So although adult females don't directly cooperate with each other, perhaps they indirectly cooperate by, by accepting their, um, their sister's offspring um, by adopting them. Um, and it could also potentially be used to look at uh, non-kin mediated benefits of group living because we do have these two different species that obviously don't have close genetic relatedness. Um, so, so whether there's some benefits of, of actually um, um, that aren't directly related to, um, to kin selected benefits. Right. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone, for listening to my talk today. And I'd really like to thank the organizers for this awesome um, seminar series. And it's been really great uh, to be here today. Um, and also, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators. Um, and um, the fantastic people that took many of these beautiful pictures that I've been showing in my presentation today uh, and my uh, various funders. Thank you very much, everybody. Hey, thank you, Lena, for a really fascinating talk. Um, and if you could uh, stop sharing your screen just for a moment. Um, of course, if people have questions and you wanna show to figure or something, um, you have access to that tool, I think. Um, so now's the time for uh, some discussion. Uh, just a reminder in the discussion format, um, if you have a question, please enter a question mark into the chat. Um, and when I call on you, if you would please, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, please state your name and affiliation. We're trying to get folks to know each other in this community. So um, please do that. And we really want to um, encourage uh, the, the junior folks to ask questions. Um, so if you're a student or a postdoc, please jump right in. Of course, anyone jump right in, but uh, I'd like to get some of the younger folks talking as well. All right, so I do see a question coming in. So the first one is from Sari Van Bell. Hi, I'm Sari van Bale. I'm at the University of Texas in, in Austin and I work with howler monkeys and I have arachnophobia. So I do think you did convince the audience to explain how this system is a wonderful system to work with and to address fantastic questions about the evolution of um, group living and such. So. I give you that, despite my <laughs> arachnophobia. Um, I was wondering with the colonial spiders, you said that they are terrestrial or territorial rather, um, not terrestrial, and um, that's stupid, um, <laughs> territorial in that I'm wondering how, how, how that is, why are they territorial? I mean, they come together to build this big spider wraps, yet they have what you call like individual sheets. And then it seems that they are territorial, but why would that be? And, and why then come together to build these big spider webs, these big co colonials that then must attract uh, predators and parasites and whatnot. That's, so why are they territorial? Yeah, so <clears throat> that was a great question. I am... Um... I mean, one, one of the reasons that they uh, are territorial towards each other could be the fact that they may not necessarily be related to each other. 
so they might not want to share their prey or their resources so the webs they the, this the individual territories they built are um quite um, valuable. They invest a lot of silk uh, into building these individual territories. So they won't um, necessarily want to share that with anybody else. Um, so, so the benefits they might gain from actually building these large um, colonies together, even though it, it, seem, it seems like they might be extremely conspicuous, as you say, to, to predators that might come in and eat them. In fact, when they all put their big very um, sturdy silk together like that, it, it can become quite impenetrable. So uh, so birds tend to avoid them because they might just get completely entangled in, in silk um, and perhaps you know, lizards and other um, predators like that might avoid it. Uh, ants seem to be quite a big problem for, for a group living spiders um, or spiders in, in general. And perhaps uh, it, it can deter um, ants from, from entering these large nests. Um, there can also be um, benefits of um, uh, like foraging uh, benefits potentially. So, or like um, communicate, basically communication. So of course spiders all communicate via vibration. So uh, if, a, if a prey enters a, a nest up here, all the spiders in the entire colony will be able to feel it and might get in a ready state for attacking another prey that might come along. Um, or if the first, um, basically if a, if a prey comes in up here and it sort of wriggles loose and falls down, then the second spider down might be able to catch it. Whereas if they were solita solitary and that prey just fell through, that prey would be lost. Um, so that might be foraging benefits. But again, I mean, it's, we haven't really found any I mean, these are all a little bit sort of theoretical. I don't think we have any great evidence of, of, of these uh, mechanisms going on yet. I mean, there's some er evidence of the foraging benefits, but, um, but yeah, lo lots of studies still to do. <laughs> Would the position of each individual spider then, whether you're in the center of the colony or outwards, one would think that if you're at the outskirt, you might capture more prey. I assume that these are little buggy things that need to fly in or crawl in and that if you're at the outskirt, you're at better positions. Yes. For, um, for preying yourself, for food acquisition yourself, but then for predators, it might be the other way around, right? That you're better off yes, being yeah. at the center. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's that, 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 that's, that's that trade-off. And, and they, do, they, they, they do sometimes fight each other for the best positions within the colony. And, and a larger spider might uh, chase away a smaller spider and say, actually, I want this position because it's better. So yeah, the, there is conflict within the colony for sure. Well, very interesting. Great, thank you. Um, so just a reminder, the folks on YouTube, I am monitoring your questions. So um, if you have questions coming in, please post them and I will pass them along to Lena. Um, the next question comes from David Fisher. Hi, I'm David. I'm at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland and I study social networks and the role social interactions play in evolution. Uh, so that was fascinating. Yeah, thanks very much for sending that stuff. I, I love social spiders, so I know it's going to be hooked. Um, I was wondering about the role of dispersal play. So you mentioned that um, there's this, this lack of pre-mating dispersal happening in the social species. And I was wondering what drives that sudden like, that loss of dispersal? And, and is it essentially is the, the lack, the degree of inbreeding and then this cooperative behavior, are they, are they both driven by the loss of dispersal? And so they're actually almost somewhat independent in a, in a way because they're being driven by this, this, this lack of dispersal. And then what causes the lack of dispersal? Is anything to do with ecology? Yeah, so, um, so, so in, these, uh, in the social spiders, um, well, let's talk about the this, this sub-social spiders, the ancestral state. So um, their dispersion stage is, is quite risky. So, so there's high mortality uh, associated with dispersal. So definitely, um, more, I think the, the mortality rates associated with dispersal is what it probably has mainly um, selected for. It could also be um, just the ease of, of finding a mate. Um, um, that has uh, selected for, for, for not dispersing. And then, so the subsocial spiders, they don't 
dispersed that far. So there is actually some degree of inbreeding already going on in the in the subsocial spiders. It's not at all, as, as I showed with the genetic data, it's not at all at the same level as social ones, but they're sort of already um, in a way um, pre-adapted to, to, um, to being able to to inbreed without any sort of negative consequences, or it, at, at least as, as far as we can see, there's, we can't really detect any inbreeding depression um, in the social spiders. So, so perhaps, perhaps that that sort of we always we, we always think about inbreeding as like a huge cost, but actually, when if the cost is not that big because you're already sort of pre-adapted to being able to to tolerate it somehow. Uh, and the cost of dispersal is high, and it's difficult to find mates, then that might be what, what switches over. And the environment might be harsh. Um, so when they build these, um, these nests uh, to, together, um, it, they, they become quite um, in, impen impenetrable for, for a lot of predators. So, I mean, there's all these um, great benefits of, of staying in the group, as long as you can tolerate the 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 inbreeding and sorry I, what was the second that was the second part to your question wasn't there um well, well it was more you know yeah so is it well i i mean like i said it does this this loss and dispersal depends on ecology and you said but essentially it does although although i don't i don't know if you know why it would differ between these closely related species which i assume live near each other um but i don't really know and then uh, yeah and then so that the, the, the lack of the, the high degree of inbreeding and the like cooperative breeding are actually somewhat independent effectively because they're both they didn't, they didn't like one didn't cause the other they're, they're both caused by just lack of dispersal yeah i mean i suppose um in theory you could still have like in theory you could still have the males dispersing out and maintaining some uh, um gene flow amongst um populations um, and still have cooperative breeding, but perhaps that that dispersal. Is, I mean, I, I, it, it's really hard to say because they just don't do it, you know. And you know, I for me, I would say actually, it, you know, it would make a lot of sense for the males to disperse out to get some gene flow, but they just they just don't. Um, and 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 it, I mean, I, I'm guessing it must be something about just the the high uh, mortality rate. But yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you. Okay, our next question is from Ricky. Hi. You guys hear me okay? I'm good. Cool. All right, thank you. Uh, I was, first of all, this talk was really cool. Uh, <laughs> as somebody who's new to like both, I come from, a, I'm uh, at Cornell University. I'm a first year grad student. And I'm from a motor lab. So this has been a really, this seminar series in general has been a really excellent opportunity for me to learn both about social behavior and about evolution. So thank you. Uh, and your talk has certainly been an excellent example of that. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about your experiment with the C. Bilde and C. Nigra, if I can ask. Uh, so can they mate together and produce viable offspring? I, I don't. I don't think so because uh, genetically they're they're completely distinct. There's no there's no um, sign of any uh, pre hybridization between the two species. No. Cool. Okay. Uh, my second question is. So you said that they don't seem to take care of the other species' offspring. Do the other offspring not move towards them across the leaf? That. I don't know. Um, I think they probably, I'm trying to think back now about the actual data. So it's, I'm still analyzing it because I've been waiting for this much satellite data to come in to finalize the, the analysis. But as far as I remember, they do sort of try to move in, but then for some reason, maybe get rejected. Maybe the female doesn't care for them more. I mean, there must there must be some species recognition going on. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it's the if it's the the mother that rejects them or if it's the babies that end up going going away. I, I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, I have my last question, if that's okay. Um, I have 
So in my undergrad in university, one of the things I learned was that highly social species tend to have uh, individual recognition. Do you know if there are any spider or if your spiders or others have individual recognition? Um, most most um, likely no. Um, in fact, we, we have been trying to find out whether they can um, recognize colony mates and social spiders they just let's know we can't detect any difference in their behavior they're just i mean they're absolutely happy to hang out with anyone um they're very very to tolerant and in fact there's all sorts of other weird little organisms that come and live inside the colonies as well uh, because i don't know because they can sure. <laughs> the social spiders are really very tolerant and docile and um happy to just hang out with anybody that's fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, our next question comes from Marin Hook. Hello, thanks also for your very nice talk. Um, I have a minor pied question. Um, do you spot, or did you find that your spiders follow the predictions of um, uh, adaptive sex allocation so that you have more fe uh, female bias more females than males because uh, in the very closely related kin groups because if they are all related um why should mothers invest in lots of sons if they all made with their sisters yeah exactly yeah so we do have a a, a primary um female bias sex ratio so so um so there are many, many more females being produced than males because you don't you don't really need that many males to because the males can mate multiple times. So you don't really need that many males to um, to keep the colony going. And that happens in all the social spiders. So they have read the literature. They have what? Sorry. They have read the literature and conform to the rules. The spiders. Sorry. Um, I well, I mean, it's, I, I'm I'm not not a hundred percent sure about that. That I mean, I the the sex ratio bias is not something I have I've studied myself. So I'm okay. afraid I can't, I can't but say. They, they follow the rules, so <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, I guess yeah, I guess they do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to interject a question from YouTube. Um, so Clara B. Jones asked, are all species that you've been studying diurnal? Um, as in, um, as in like, um, like live for a year, right? I'm not, not sure exactly where, where the question was going, but maybe we'll come back to it. I'll give, Claire, um, a chance to maybe have a follow-up question. She's coming from YouTube and there's a bit of a delay. So maybe this will give her a chance to address that. Um, I do see a comment from David. Uh, there is some nocturnal activity in this. Right, okay, so all oh, right, okay. So whether they, whether they occur, like whether they, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they sort of, there's a lot of activity going on at night for sure in, in in all uh, most spiders, I think, um, but they're also quite sort of um, 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 opportunistic in the sense that they will come out if if something um, falls into the the nest in the daytime. Yeah, they they will um, come out. They they tend to to do a lot of the ne the the um, nest building at night um, and maintaining the web at night. Um, but so they, they might be slightly more active at night actually than during the day, but they will also happily catch prey during the day. Great, thank you. Um, our next question uh, comes from Niklas Paulsen. Yep, hello. Uh, th thank you for a great talk. Yeah, I'm Niklas Paulsen, currently a PhD student at the University of Bern studying cooperation in the Norway rats. And sort of as a cooperation person, I was a little curious. You mentioned the conflict in your social spiders, and at least twice you've mentioned sort of like the, like the benefits of like cost of silk and sort of like being reduced by these large. So I was wondering about like 
is, do you have any knowledge on how these social spiders deal with cheaters? Because, I mean, think, example that comes to mind, spiders like sort of eating old web to sort of like to be able to recycle it a bit and the nutrients. If, like, if you would have individuals that sort of devour the web of others or not contribute at all to the web and basically just walk around and try to steal prey, like, is there some such a thing as sort of eviction or would there be like cannibalism as sort of a punishment when you have those that misbehave? Anything like that, like some kind of punishment system? Um, I don't think so because they, again, because there's no individual recognition. So I don't think they can really keep track of that. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think anybody has really looked into to, to cheating behavior um, specifically. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if they are cheaters within the system. Yeah, I would, I, I would sort of expect them to pop up every now and then. But it's, um, I was thinking since you said already that they don't, they don't seem to have, they probably don't have individual recognition. I was thinking you could still operate on a one strike and you're out system. You don't really need to remember anyone. Anyone that misbehaves gets the stick, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, the next question actually is a, I think there is a question here in a comment by Max or, or hi, did I say that correctly? <laughs> Um, I hope I came close. Um, it says, hi, Lizana Max here, master students from uh, Wageningen and Groningen, Groningen Universities in the Netherlands. They say, thanks for a great presentation. They can't talk, so they were, were interested in how you explain the extraordinarily low genetic diversity at the species level in social spiders. They say they may have missed it, but they're looking for a little clarification there. Um. So, so maybe the, the clarification was about, um, so ba basically because of the inbreeding and because of the reproductive skew and then combined with the fact that we've got um, high extinction rates of, of both nest and entire populations that just sort of get wiped out for some reason and then repopulated by um, maybe a single female that has already made it from um, with her siblings in her colony, she comes in and starts a colony and that colony then spreads out uh, into that population. Um, so, that, so that sort of process of, of high lineage turnover where entire populations go extinct and then areas get repopulated, that sort of homogenizes the genetic diversity um, across in the entire species basically and, and, and until the point where that's basically almost no genetic diversity left um, at all. So Max, if you'd like, <laughs> if Max, if you'd like me to give you a, a follow-up, um, ah, so he says basically founder effects and already inbred populations. Okay. Um, the next question goes to Kaya Tombach. Hi, um, I'm Kaya Tombach. I'm a postdoc it, at uh, Hunter College, CUNY. Um, I'm gonna echo everyone else's uh, congratulations for such a nice talk that was fascinating. Um, I was also similarly struck by the high level of inbreeding and the persistence of these highly, highly inbred populations um, and uh, the quality of over quantity trade-off that they seem to be making with their eggs. Um, I was struck that um, it might not uh, only be a selection for greater advantages in quality, but also um, a re relaxation for the selection for quantity, because if you are all very inbred, then, you know, with each offspring, you don't get to roll as many dice, basically, right, um, genetically speaking. And so um, in an unpredictable environment, quantity won't help you as much as if you have more um, genetic diversity. So uh, do you think then that social spiders might be disadvantaged or restricted to um, environments where the sort of frequency of perturbation or the disturbance duration, um, you know, m must be at like a certain rate or a certain duration for them to be able to survive since they'll have to found with basically the same set of genes um, quickly after local extinction. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly seem to exist um, mainly in, in in environments that are in in some way 
a bit harsh. So, so either um, environments uh, like really dry environments or in environments in the jungle where there's loads of rainfall that, that usually um, destroys single um, single webs. So, so some, something that, um, you know, environments that might be slightly um, um, well, con constrained or or difficult. Um, sorry, was was that what what you what you meant as well? Or uh... yeah, basically whether there's like a certain rate or duration of perturbation that will um, cut them out of a, a habitat if that's sort of the state of the habitat um, because of those dynamics. Yeah, I mean, it could also be it could also be. Um, I mean, those dynamics could also be. Um, like pet pests and parasites that invade the population, and then because of the genetic low genetic diversity, they can't really <laughs> adapt um, very well, and just that can wipe out an entire population. But but then again, they sort of you know they just repopulate with <laughs> basically the same genetic uh, makeup. So it's a bit uh, it's, it's really yeah it's really interesting, quite intriguing really. Okay, uh, so the next question is from Karsten. Yes, hello, I'm Karsten Schradin, a researcher at the CNRS in Strasbourg, France, studying mammalian social evolution in South Africa and comparatively. It was really a fascinating talk and uh, it was for me such an example of this high biodiversity of social systems we find in the animal kingdom together with the other talks we had in the series and it's really um, so amazing to, to hear these things. Now, when comparing these um, cooperative spiders with cooperative vertebrates, one big difference is this high social tolerance. When you put some meerkats into another group or striped mice or, ma or marmosets, it will just get killed and it will be, be hammock. It's maybe not so difficult to explain because these spiders are not mobile, but they are the place while these um, marmosets and, and um, Meerkats, they move around with group and they encounter other groups. So my question is then rather, why are the solitary spiders or the, um, um, the colonial spiders, why are they so territorial? And are they really territorial or do they just treat con specifics like prey? Oh um, yeah, they're, they're definitely uh, territorial. They don't they don't attack each other like like prey, and they will sort of also sometimes. They'll certainly f fight each other in the sense that if you've got a really big spider and then a smaller spider within the colony, the bigger spider might sometimes steal prey from the smaller spider or or basically evict the smaller spider out of its uh, territory and, and take over that territory if it's a better territory. Um, so so they they certainly um, they certainly do not treat each other like prey um, and. And I think there just hasn't been selection for them to, um, to, to tolerate each other at a higher level. So, so in, in spiders, the, you know, the basal um, behavior is basically to always be super aggressive to, <laughs> towards anything, <laughs> including uh, conspecifics. So I think it requires quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of selection to, to get rid of that um that trait uh, and in and basically because the the colonial spiders they don't have any um, maternal care so there's no so so the the spiderlings baby spiders are not necessarily tolerant of each other they 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 don't require um the ability to, to tolerate each other because they don't have to stick around and share food with you know by being fed by their mother and i think that that is the key to evolving these more cooperative uh, social behaviors is the fact that maternal care requires juveniles to tolerate each other so if that doesn't exist then um it's very difficult to then evolve a toler like a higher to level of tolerance cooperation um, amongst adults. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so the other spiders are territorial because they compete for the best resources, the best territories, and they steal each other's food if they can. Is that the reason why they are aggressive towards each yeah. other? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, our next question comes from Charlotte Olivier. 
So, uh, hello, so I'm Charlotte Anais Olivier, a PhD student uh, working on the evolution of social organization in mammals um, at the IPHC in Strasbourg, France. And so I had, uh, so thanks for your talk. And I had a question about colonial uh, spiders. So you explained that um, each spider has its own territory, but I did not understand how they could feed on webs that are like sometimes uh, the size of a tree. I'm, I'm curious about how the spiders in the center of the web can feed and uh, do they uh, move to where the food is and then, and then so they cross the territories of other spiders or, yeah, I'm curious about the spiders in the center. How do they? Yeah, no, that's actually a really, really good question. Uh, I'm not, I, I'm not entirely sure about that, but, the, but the, certainly um, in some environments, the, the prey are quite sort of large and, uh, and can relatively easy sort of kick its way out of the web. So these spiders um, create web, which is not um, sticky. So they don't have glue in the silk. Um, so the only way they sort of get entangled is, is, is by the, the sort of um, mechanical, physical structure of, of the web. So they can sometimes just sort of kick their, their way out. So if you're in the middle, you might catch the prey that just has fallen through some of the other um, webs above you um, and then end up being able to actually catch that prey that has then struggled so much through the other ones that it's tired out. So it might just be a, an easier uh, meal because you get a tired prey that's easier to, to kill. Um, that's the only thing I can I can think of because sm smaller flying prey um, and and butterflies and things like that that are not so heavy they they for sure wouldn't be able to actually get into the center of the web, um, so so I'm just I'm just speculating that that's how they actually catch their prey I I I, I haven't actually uh, looked at the the spiders in the center to to really understand that but it's a really good point I think that would be really really fun to to look at. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I have a series of questions from uh, YouTube. Um, I'm going to read them one at a time, I think. Uh, so the first comes from uh, Florencia Campon, uh, associated with Conacy in Argentina. Uh, she said, very interesting talk, and she's interested in the putative contra contradiction of low genetic variability and widespread distribution in social spiders. Um, and she said that uh, her, her comment goes towards plasticity. You said that it may have high levels of plasticity and physiological traits. So what would you expect plasticity? Uh, so what types of plasticity would you expect to be selected for? Um, like thermal, thermal tolerance um, and um, I suppose, um, behavioral mechanisms with regards to like high or low rainfall, um, perhaps um, the ability to, um, to mature at a smaller body size if there's less prey. Um, so, so basically being flexible in, in the way, also being flexible with regards to reproductive skew. So for example, if, if it's a great year or a great, you know, an area with lots of prey, um, perhaps they all eat enough to be able to reproduce, but they have that flexibility in, in perhaps just allowing a few of the colony members to eat enough to be able to reproduce. Um, so so th like plasticity and those kind of uh, traits. Um, I don't know if there's plasticity in the, in the sex ratio as well. I'm not, I, I don't really know anything about that. Um, perhaps plasticity in, um, in at what point they actually disperse, like at what point do they decide, okay, now this area is no good anymore. Now we're going to, uh, balloon. So spiders, they can fly by ballooning. They'll release some silk and then fly off and, and travel long distances. Um, so perhaps they can go for many generations without actually that long, dis long distance dispersal, but then they have that, um, um, plasticity. So the, the ability to, to choose to disperse if, if, um, uh, conditions become adverse. I hope that <laughs> at least it answers the question a little bit. Sure. Um, uh, Florencia, um, Florencia also asked, uh, um, 
about the importance of variability in rainfall. Um, do you have any information on that regarding the social spiders? Yeah, I think I think uh, definitely in um, in the Anolosoma spiders uh, in in the um, in the Americas that it can experience very high uh, strong uh, rainfall. I think the um, the social spider webs are much more um, much stronger and can withstand these kind of um, um, high levels of rainfall than the, than the smaller. Um, solitary spider webs. So I think that in at least in the in the Americas, uh, I think that is um, that that is a, a strong strong selector. I think um, perhaps less so in in other parts of uh, the world where there's less rainfall. Um, but yeah, definitely in in Anolosmus. And there's one more, I think you already answered this. There's one more question coming from Matthew Passenger Digger. Um, he's from UT Knoxville, just up the road from me. Um, he says, thanks, Lane. And, and I, he was asking about the, um, do these social spiders create homeostatic physical environments? I think you already answered that, but I'm not sure. I'll give you a chance. Homeostatic physical, so like inside the nest, where they, they can control the temperature inside the nest, or um, I'm guessing yes. Yeah. So um, so I think um, I think some of my collaborators looked at that because we thought they probably can. Um, so we put they put uh, like thermometers inside the nests, uh, but actually inside the nest it was sometimes even hotter <laughs> than it was outside the nest. So. Um, so uh, I th as far as I remember, but this is not uh, research I was directly involved with, but, but as far as I remember, they, ca they can't actually um, very well um, control the, the microclimate inside the nest. Okay. All right. Um, so now I'm gonna come back to the list here um, in the Zoom session. And the next question comes from uh, Yuval Shalem. Hi, uh, I'm Yuval. I am a master's student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem at Guy Bloch's B Lab. Uh, we are working on B sociality. And first, I want to join everyone else and say that the lecture was uh, very, very interesting. And thank you so much. Uh, uh, my question is about uh, uh, some of the points about uh, dispersal. Uh, basically, I kept I kept uh, thinking about uh, how everything is related to being sociality, and uh, it was uh, really amazing to me that they don't disperse the spiders, and it also I guess creates this cycle of uh, you have uh, you have this bias where there are more females because uh, the sp the males don't disperse uh, and. Uh, and it just uh, uh, creates this, uh, I guess, some kind of evolutionary selection pressure cycle. And I was, uh, I wanted to ask if it's uh, like that in uh, all of, you said there are 20 social species of spiders that we know of. I wanted to ask if it's like that. This cycle was not broken in any of them. And if not, uh, then uh, uh, one question is, do you think we're just like uh, starting to describe all these uh, species? Maybe we just didn't find the, the species that dispels yet. Or if, uh, if this, uh, if this uh, principle holds, then uh, why? And uh, like I was, I started to think about uh, wings and the ability to fly. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I know some spiders can disperse with the wind, so uh, it's not uh, might not be the explanation. So yeah, I wonder why this cycle was not broken as far as we know. Yeah, I mean, as as far as 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 far as we know, with all the evidence we have so far, all social spiders once they become proper corpsive breeders they completely stop dispersing before mating anyway. Um, both males and females stop dispersing um, and they do become super inbred and they do end up with a high female, high, extremely highly female biased sex ratio. So it does seem to be like 
that is just how to be social in a spider. Um, I mean, I, I can't, of course, I can't say for sure whether there's a few species where occasionally a male may, my, might um, might disperse, uh, but but in the in the in the in the genetics like um, in the uh, genetic diversity study I showed you with the Stegodipha spiders, for sure, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> and that's probably the most detailed study we have so far of the social spiders. So for sure, in the Stegodipha spiders, they just they just don't. <laughs> at least if you know if we look at the the, the genetic data. Um, so so yeah, I mean. Um, if if males, if as a social spider you wanted to maintain the ability to have males disperse, you would need to continue producing quite a lot of males because of the mortality rate. So it's probably, I'm totally guessing here, <laughs> it's probably something about it just being, because the females are the corporative uh, sex, of course, so they... Um, they're just much more valuable. So it's really quite valuable to be able to say, right, okay, I'm just not going to produce any males or hardly any males anymore because then I can produce lots of females that can cooperate and do all these amazing things in the colony. Um, and, you know, that's probably just a, a stronger selective driver. And, and again, in breeding, it just appears not to be such a big deal for them, at least for this, you know, for the species. But then again, it could also be that um, at the moment, so yeah, as, as you said, we have about 20, 20 species of, of social spiders now, but it could also be that in the past, we've had loads of other social, spe spe um, social spider species that have just all gone extinct because they lose the ability to, to, to speciate and, and adapt. So of course that's harder to, <laughs> to actually show, but, but it's perfectly possible that, um, that they're basically, you know, once you become social and inbred, you won't actually live forever or you know that you're much more likely to go extinct that is perfectly possible as well so it's you know it's a, in the short term it's a great strategy but perhaps in the long term they might just go extinct thank you so much it's kind of like it sounds like there's something in the way of life of spiders that <laughs> might be a uh, no, not a very good uh, platform for the maybe for the development of a uh, high sociality maybe maybe but but the, the species that are social now of you know thriving and as you saw occurring over large geographical areas and whenever they do occur they're actually really abundant and really common um so you know they're, they're doing great <laughs> thank you so much you're welcome. All right, so our next question comes from, uh, I believe, Zulema. Yeah, um, Zulema Tang Martinez, University of Missouri in St. Louis. I'm retired. Um, thank you for a really, really interesting talk. And I, I have several thoughts, and I can't remember the species names, um, but maybe you've heard of this or read about this. Um, I, I, I have a recollection that um, among colonial species, uh, there are some, or maybe only one species, I'm not sure, that has, uh, it's an orb weaver, and it has individual webs, the webs are connected, um, and each spider sits on a web, but they're not aggressive, so that if one spider enters the web of another, the resident of the second web just moves on to a third web and that resident moves on to a fourth web and so on. So they're basically playing musical chairs. But the thing that I think is interesting is the reduction in aggression. Um, and then I believe there's another species. And again, I can't remember the name where they, during the day, they stay in bivouacs with many, many, many spiders together and then only at night they go out and then they set up individual webs and become solitary hunters essentially. And so I was thinking about that along with, ah, I see that Leticia is giving us the names. 
<laughs> of the, uh, the species. Thanks, Leticia. Um, and, you know, I, I was really struck by the fact that we have now several examples of a reduction in aggression among this colonial species. And then we also have your chikunia species where you get our colonial and you get root care um, and even adoption of um, conspecifics. And it just, um, I mean, if this ever all came together, you essentially would be on your way very, very uh, closely to having a social spider like the ones that, you know, we re regard as truly, uh, as really being social rather than colonial. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. And then the other question I had was, um, do you, in the chikunya, do you always get the two species together or do you have colonies where only one species makes up the colony? Okay, so the, your last question first. Um, we do get colonies uh, of just a single species as well. Um, so it, it, it can just be completely, you know, arbitrary. Um, I don't know um, when that when it happens and when it doesn't yet. Um, with regards to the other species you mentioned, I, I'm not um, really sure about the musical chair as a spider um, and which one which one that is. Um, but that's really interesting. I'd like to learn about that one. Uh, I am familiar with the Periwixia bistriata, so the one the, um, that you the, where they live in bee works and then at night they come out uh, to build webs. Uh, and and honestly, I. I, I don't know even how to classify that one because it, that behavior is so different from, from any of the other uh, group living spiders. And I'm really intrigued by it and I would love to go and study it. Basically, um, I think they occur in, in Brazil. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I, I would really like to, to study those more closely. And um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably family groups, but I don't know. Um, so, so you know, it, it would be even more interesting if they're not if they're not actually um, related to each other within within those um, groups. But but yeah, um, yes. I mean, it, it could be that we have uh, that we might discover a, a, a social species at some point that that, that hasn't uh, evolved via the sort of traditional route. I mean, that would be amazing. I, I love it when there's sort of, you know, exceptions to the rules in, in science and in biology. So, so yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other one, of course, is, is Malus gregalis, which is the Mexican species, which in many, many ways is very similar to the typical social spiders that evolved, you know, with the route that you discussed. But there's also differences that um, make it sort of an outlier. And I know that some people, I, I personally don't think that the evidence is, is really there that have suggested that it might have evolved from a colonial species. But that's, I think that's, um, that's probably, I, I don't think the evidence is probably there now to say that with any confidence. I, and of course, as far as I know, um, I'm not sure that there have been more recent studies on Malus gregalis. Maybe Leticia would know, but, but thank you very much. It's really fascinating. Thank you. So we have another question in the queue. It's uh, David Valencia. Hello, uh, my name is David, David Valencia. I am studying a master's degree in Université Sorbonne Paris Nord in Paris. I want to thank you for such a good talk. And um, I want to ask you if uh, within a colony of spiders, of colonial spiders, they have uh, different size territories. And if that depended on maybe body size or if it's in the middle of in the outer part of the colony. Yeah, so basically um, the bigger the spider is, the bigger uh, web it produces. So so as they grow, they produce larger, uh, larger territories. Um, and I think it's, um, I think there's sort of like a, a sweet spot in, inside the colony, but perhaps not, not too far inside the colony that's like, you know, preferred by the, by the large individuals that they will basically sort of fight the, the smaller ones off for. 
Um, so, um, so, so yeah, they do, they do have, have different sized territories, but, but mainly that's predicted by their, their body size and their growth rate. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And I also wanted to ask if there is some kind of inheritance when one of the spider dies or leaves or whatever. Um, that well, that's actually one of the one of my next questions as well that I am really really curious to uh, to investigate further because they these are large um, um, valuable resources these webs so so I think that they can they can be used by uh, either conspecifics or by others so other spiders within that you know community might take take them over I mean in fact you, you quite often see. Um, em empty webs in the um, um, it, it, at my field site in Spain, and sometimes they are then inhabited by other species uh, that seem to have just sort of taken them over and, and using them. So, so yes, I think there is, but it's it's a hypothesis that I am definitely um, you know what what to want to study. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll give folks just a last opportunity to ask a question. We're coming up on quarter of uh, one in the Eastern United States. Um, uh, Lena has graciously uh, agreed to talk some more afterwards. Um, and if I don't see any questions coming in, I'll end the, uh, the live stream. I don't have any more questions in